Thank you. Let's continue our evening with the panel discussion. First, we have uh, our moderator, Urva Eslat, who is uh, sitting with her back to you. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, she is uh, an adjunct fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Then uh, we have Mario Novak, who is an executive partner at Tactical Survival Concepts and planning and uh, dealing with planning and execution of safety and security training for GOs and NGOs. Uh, next to him, we have Gaur Birunur, who currently is Head of Department for Security Research and Development Department at the Information System Authority of the Republic of Estonia. Riigi infosüsteemi ameti arenduse uurimistegevuse osakonna juhataja. Next we have uh, Dr. Winfried Weil, who is uh, a policy officer at the German Federal Ministry of the Interior, uh, dealing with uh, di digital agenda and general and legal IT and digitalization is issues. And last we have Kalav Pihtl, who is the CEO of Certification Center, Certificerims Keskus, and also one of the people responsible for the Estonian ID card software. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let us start with the film itself. Uh, there were at least two different conflicts present there. The first one was a conflict between uh, citizens' interests and companies' interests. And another conflict was about between citizens' interests and uh, government's interests. So, but I understood that there's something not as you liked it to be, to start with you. <laughs> so you said that the whole film is too simplified. Could you please develop it a bit further? Yes, uh, of course, thank you. And uh, thank you uh, to the Goethe Institute for inviting me. Um, uh, I took part in the negotiations on part of the government, so uh, that's the reason why I'm a little bit biased, maybe, um, because um, what we were doing was not shown in the movie. There is the council, uh, and the council and the European Parliament both are drafting their own texts, their own uh, work, their own uh, draft of the law, and then they come together and uh, do a compromise. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the council did not allow the camera team to film in the council meetings. Um, so our work wasn't shown, which is not that problematic, of course. Um, but uh, actually, we did the same as the European Parliament, were working hours and hours, months and years on, uh, on the text. And it's really um, a very, very complex Thing, which was partly shown in the movie, um, but um, only in a very simplified way, as you said. Uh, simplified because of several reasons. Um, um, it, it was black and white. It was the good side, uh, which is the privacy activists, and um, which is the uh, certain uh, political parties, and it was the bad side, which is the companies. Uh, Are the companies bad? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they were shown like, like uh, institutions that make money out of your personal data. And uh, that was somehow shown as a bad thing. And then, of course, the governments as, as were shown as bad actors, um, which I would deny. Uh, we, we, we had the same um, approach to, to do a good law for all actors, but uh, we had um, not only uh, our interest was not only to support certain privacy um, interests, but also to support any kind of uh, rights. And uh, the the whole law is on personal data. The approach uh, of personal data is very wide. So we were regulating not only Google and Facebook. We are regulating freedom of expression. We are regulating freedom of uh, science, scientific uh, progress. We are uh, regulating with this law uh, the small companies. We are even regulating um, what we um, say in the internet. So I just uh, two hours ago I just uh, wrote uh, on Twitter uh, that I'm glad to be here and to discuss. Uh, 
uh, with Kalev, uh, Kauer, and uh, Urwe, and um, Mario tonight. And that was a breach of this law. Because um, the, the, this law says that you have to inform the data subject, which I did not. So <laughs> um, this, this law is uh, partly not uh, internet proof, it's not future proof. But uh, it would be much too complex to go into those details. Um, my point is just that uh, it, it showed a political fight with certain political interests. Vivian Reding wanted to make a, his, her success. And of course, the politicians wanted to show, oh, we have done something for the privacy activists, for the, for the citizens. Um, and it was an unfair fight. We did not even, last, last point, um, Snowden played a big role. This law wouldn't be there uh, if, it, if, if there wouldn't be a Snow, Snowden would have ha wouldn't have happened, but we even did not regulate the uh, agent the, the secret agencies. The, the law is not about is not about uh, is not about uh, the secret services. The EU doesn't even have a competence on that. So we are we're regulating the whole sphere of uh, of data processing. Uh, which can be a, a small or medium-sized firm, which can be any one of you, and which can be uh, the government. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, so <laughs> what I found is that this is perfect example that the European Union actually works and works very well. So this this film is something every Eurosceptic should uh, <laughs> watch because there is a problem, European and then you. Works. Hard. <laughs> hard. Yes, please. Can I disagree uh, with you? Uh, of course. So it was a good film about how the sausage is actually being made. Uh, one thing that missed, I think, was actually the preconditions on which the action actually started. And what are the preconditions? Most of us are using a computer or a device like this, which happens to have, well, like, what are the basis of this device? It works on mathematics from the states software operating system from United States, services mostly from United States, and hardware mostly from China, Philippines, wherever. And now European Union suddenly found that all its citizens are using something which is based coming from the other parts of the world. And now it's frantically, maybe not so frantically, but anyway, way too late, understood that it must do something. And now we are trying, as European Union, to first create, adopt, and enforce a law which is actually going to be applied to the mathematicians in the United States, service providers anywhere else, and hardware makers in the China. So I think that the European Union came to this idea about data privacy way too late. Okay, we are still first compared to the people in Asia, <laughs> in Africa, wherever. But we could have been much more proactive in this. We completely missed the mobile phones revolution. Maybe we're catching the ne next revolution, be it virtual <coughs> reality or not. But I don't. But I think that this also showed that in some places we are way too late. Good, Mario. Do you agree? Actually, uh, I'm kind of the outsider here. Uh, <laughs> I don't have an IT background. I'm not a lawyer, so uh, I watched the the movie more like from the viewpoint of a concerned citizen. Uh, to me, it was uh, very interesting how the whole thing works. I had no idea. And uh, to me, there's one statement right in the beginning uh, that Mrs. Redding uh, claimed in front of the, uh, uh, the hall. She said that 72% of all European citizens are concerned about their data privacy. Actually, uh, then it came to my mind, every day these concerned citizens distribute millions and millions of their private, this most private data on social media. So how concerned can we really be? <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, you can be very yes. concerned, <laughs> revealing everything about you. You still do it. So it's a, uh, I, I think that the uh, uh, part where they claim that the data is new, uh, new money uh, did not go to the full extent in the movie as well, which was very briefly mentioned there. Uh, but it's definitely something that you exchange some product uh, against. So, so you give out the data and you get something back. And it, it's always the question of whether the economy would work if we would exchange uh, actually first the data to money and then buy for that money the same services. Exactly. And, um, and it wouldn't most probably. And now 
I, I think that's uh, what this uh, regulation uh, is doing. I don't know how many of you actually have read the regulation that it, it talks oh. about. <laughs> so uh, the, the regulation kind of gives you um, uh, this kind of image of the European citizen that sits uh, on top of a data set and then uh, very consciously is giving out like bits of like to every kind of service provider and and if the service provider later uh, thinks that I would like to do a next thing with the, with your data, you would have to ask again from that citizen a consent to do a next thing. No, uh, very good. Give me a, a way. Then how how do you see that that how this consent that is asked basically everywhere so is given? So many different approaches, and it's your approach is very simplified. It has to be none of no. uh, like. Uh, 40 percent, maybe, right? It's not so expert yet as a technical decision. It's mm -hmm. not for a second. So that's the first rule. In the first place, it's the protection of personal data. And second, it's the convenience of user uh, the system, which is not somehow important yet, but it's an experiment. And you have to bear in mind that regulation is not only one respect, it's mm -hmm. uh, also a directive or a law enforcement because you don't have yet. You're not in experiment, but you don't know any at all. But so next year the regulation is there. I should just try to explain here that you have to, every second hour, you uh, need consent from the special advocate. Not at all. But he was right in, in one point. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, only one. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was only this one point, uh, and, and this one, this one point was right. Uh, uh, the 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 paradigm, the concept of this regulation is uh, that every data is potentially dangerous, and every data has to be treated equally. Every data, you are not allowed to process um, personal data unless you have a legal basis, and that is the. That is the big difference between the U.S. Uh, approach and the European approach. In the U.S., you are allowed to process personal data, and if you do harm to someone, then maybe the law kicks in and says, "Oh, you are fined," or something like that. In in, Euro in Europe, we have the another concept which uh, which says you always need a legal basis, and one of the legal bases is is, uh, is consent, um, but there are others like. If it's, if it's written in the law, then you are allowed to do so, or if it's written, uh, if, if you have a justified interest. But um, the idea is that everyone consciously is always aware of, oh, my, my data are lying there and there and there. Now I say no to the processing of the data there, and I say yes there, and I reclaim back my data that are lying there. And I think this concept, this paradigm is kind of illusionist or utopist, or at least not very, um, not, not, it's, not, it's not reflecting uh, the reality of most of, of the people. Just a, a comment to support Kolab's opinion. <laughs> <laughs> what is the uh, like, average citizen's understanding currently of the European Union's whatever data privacy initiatives that they may have? It is a annoying nuisance that every single website is asking me, do you agree storing cookies on your device? All the damn websites have a pop-up which is claiming something. And this is standard. I know that it is actually not related to this particular directive, so on, but the person on the status of the European Union is going to place stupid rules on everything that it ever touches, and this doesn't help. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know, but... I know, <laughs> I know, but nobody else does. Estonians can't fully stop about anything at all, about the cookies in the computer. Estonian data protection inspector has informed you put cookies into the computer. They put at least four, two of them stay in the computer. After that, you'll finish your searching from their web page. So our regulator is not following the rules. But that, that, that's exactly where, where we come to the other 
uh, ways how you can get the right uh, to uh, patch the personal data and that's written in the law or you have this how, how do you call what kind of interest do you have justified, justified. Legi <laughs> legitimate interest legitimate. justified legitimate <laughs> interest so, yeah. so basically that's like if you want to touch everybody's uh, personal data write the law about yourself and that's mm. what the uh, law enforcement does mm. so you have a separate law for them so just, that's just, why they can just two po more points okay we don't want to have a <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. legal <laughs> data protection <laughs> discussion yeah i understand that completely but Another thing is the one uh, size fits all approach. The, the, this law um, um, deals with co uh, the so-called controller, and the controller is everyone. Could be a, a, a citizen, uh, could be a company, a small, a uh, big company, and the government and all the authorities. And most of the uh, most of the regulations are um, equally. Uh, 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 apply equally to all these controllers so there is not enough differentiation um, between dangerous um, law uh, data processing and not so dangerous there is uh, only few differentiations between big and small companies actually none not 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 really and and then um, no differentiation between the big US players, uh, which sh uh, which was the aim to regulate them, Google and Facebook, and the bakery around the corner that delivers uh, the bread uh, uh, every morning. Mm. Okay, thank you for this. <laughs> uh, actually, I really want to talk about also about uh, big data and democracy. But in order to do that, I think we should first get our terms straight. So what is big data exactly? Uh, I, a um, few months ago, I started to, um, because of my job, to find out how we can use big data for public good. Not for companies, not for uh, government, but for public good. So I asked several people who actually, you know, supposed to know something about this. <laughs> and you know what they said to me? Big data is like teenage sex. Everybody uh, knows something about this. Everybody thinks that everybody else is doing this, but actually nobody does this. <laughs> I'm not quite sure it's true, but is there something about that we're, you know, maybe we're stressing this a bit too much, yes? So, my previous life uh, happened to be lived in Microsoft, which is one of those evil comp companies, and I was in touch with people who did process really big data think about all the people in the world, pretty much combined. And they had a good definition. Big data is data sets where you don't care about inputs, but you only care about the output. You don't care about the individual reasons, why somebody has clicked on this web link, or why somebody has decided to buy this product, or go there, whatnot. You only care about the aggregated combined output, the like, end results that you get out of this. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good explanation. So actually, the, the thing we're talking about is more like useful data, right? In order to data to, like, if we talk about the data as an oil, then oil itse itself, if, if oil is not processed, it's not very valuable, right? It becomes valuable when it's processed. So then it's like, you know, e equal to money. Yeah, when, when you get the information out of it, that's the Exactly. So, so is this information out of the data? Is that what we can name useful data? So basically, this is something that we can make a product of. So, so I, I started to think about this because uh, after uh, uh, Brexit and after United States presidential elections, uh, there was some kind of concern in societies that a company called uh, Cambridge Analytica was using a uh, huge amount of data in order to uh, influence political processes. So, as I see, it was exactly, it, it's not about big data, but it's about, you know, process data. So that's what actually can turn into, you know, any kind of tool, also a weapon. It's the input approach on the one hand, on the output approach on the other hand. Uh, our data protection law deals uh, has this has this input approach. 
there is a, the data minimization principle that says uh, the less data is better data. Mm. And the best is if, if there would be no data. And um, in a way, what, what in a way, <laughs> the data minimization, it's in the, it's in the, it's, <laughs> okay, no, but it says uh, that you have to uh, delete, for example, data for yeah, yeah. which you do not, have a, <laughs> do not have a, a legitimate ground on purposes, on, on processing. Um, but um, for me as well, I would say it's much more important to concentrate uh, not um, on the input, but on the output side. Mm. What mm. is done with the data? Mm. Is it, is it a dangerous processing? Is there any harm done to people? And um, we should concentrate on on this side. And um, of course, you, it's, it's a stupid uh, comparison, but in a way, you can murder someone with a knife, but you can cut bread as well. It's I, I don't like this comparison, but it's it's just. It's just the, the easiest way to... to yes, but please, to... please tell me what is actually wrong with targeted advertising? Because this is something that was done in, in elections with this data. So what's wrong about it? Why people see this as a problem? Uh, there are some places where at least the European Union thinks that discrimination is bad. And having the data allows you to discriminate in all cases. So fundamentally, can you give us some examples, please? Any kind of hiring process, any kind of uh, having somebody to do something that by law is required that you must be open to every application, every applicant. So what with big data, even if you're not actually disclosing the identity, you can still discriminate. Yeah, I think that it was in, in a movie that said about like uh, red high heels or something. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it is like the... Uh, discrimination on the uh, the level where you personally feel offended by the fact that you are not shown the emotion that your neighbor sees like you are not worthy or something like that so so you can be offended by whatever so that's the uh, whole story if you treat everybody the same then nobody's offended uh, the same but i would be offended as if i would be treated as everybody else so <laughs> therefore you, you will offend somebody anyway yeah so the biggest field where it actually comes into play will be medical insurance, for sure. That uh, there is there are different paradigms of paying for medication or health uh, in the States and in the socialist European Union. Uh, European Union thinks that everybody should be paying in the same way and then gets the services. And the United States thinks that based on what you are doing, how you are behaving, how you are living, it is fine that your cost of uh, medicine is different. And uh, having big data on the behaviors, the behavior habits of people allows you to make the medical insurance to be exactly targeted what they're doing. So if you have like whatever risk that is characterized by one of the behaviors that you have, the like private medical insurance market can, can target you exactly, which I think the European Union or at least some of the countries think is wrong. Mm. Have you ever experienced personally that big data is used against you in some ways? Anybody? I, I've thought about that quite uh, often and I never found out that I'm, I've per I was personally in contact with big data at all. There are sometimes um, offers to you by, by websites like booking.com uh, mm. or, or by Facebook as well where they say our algorithm specialists were working on your data mm -hmm. and they found out that your most probable uh, um, holiday aims will be Prague, uh, Tallinn and a small town in Germany. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and then I think, oh wow, when, when this is the outcome of your big data analysis, uh, then uh, it's not very satisfying. Did you tell did you feel discriminated? No, no, of course no. not. <laughs> but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, I'm not. Uh, um, I'm a lawyer, so I'm not working uh, technically with big data, and I'm I'm a just in terms of data protection law, data subject, which yeah. hasn't so far been discriminated. I think. I think, but maybe I haven't got a credit or so because of big data, which you might not know. 
Uh, just just a second. We will take questions later. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I no, don't think I've never. Been. So, all I'm saying he, of course, he <laughs> has been abused by big data. But discrimination works best if the person who has been discriminated okay. against doesn't know. <laughs> so, may, so, so maybe like there have been like tens and tens of job ads that could be fitting his actually <clears throat> wishes, what not, but that he hasn't seen because the data has decided that he cannot see those, and so on. Okay. So the point is that we don't know if we are discriminated or not. Okay, can you, yeah, do you want to add something? Just to go to the uh, exhibition, of course, and there is uh, like those three buttons where you see very well how you are discriminated, just based on the fact where you make your query from. Um, so it's in San Inat, uh, what is what the hall, that hall, uh, uh, where you uh, see that. But uh, when I first created my Facebook account. I think that uh, after the creation, uh, Facebook offered me 10 different people like to friend with very quickly. Out of those 10, eight were some people who are actually know. So that was scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because for me, I just uh, wrote in my name uh, and my birth date, I, I think, by that time. But for whatever reason, uh, it would actually show me eight people out of ten whom I knew. Uh, I don't know so many people. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever made a Facebook account to somebody else? Me, no. But I have. <laughs> and you get the same. I make a, a Facebook account to a non-existing yet Daniel Rauset on Facebook and I get to know who, was his, who are his real-life friends. Ooh, wow. Okay. wow. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Uh, it is Kaur is making from his computer Tanya's account, and he gets to know who are Tanya's friends. So that's the point. So you can uh, actually. That's a bit scary indeed. <laughs> so, so the, to, if we're talking about Google, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, so we're talking about this relation between citizen and companies, right? So um, you already mentioned that there is nothing wrong about you know uh, changing uh, data for money. Because you know, people usually don't want to, you know, pay for things that are online. For example, I used to work as a journalist. That was a really hard job to make people to pay for a news. So, so basically, I know how they really. I really believe that you know everything should be free. And but you know, those kind of things like uh, making a Facebook, for example, as a company, it requires some money <laughs> and running this company. Yeah. So of course, there's some kind of interest, you know, to get some money back. Uh, but you know what, what actually interests me about this question is that it seems that people are okay with giving out the information. They just don't want this information to be used. I want to uh, be used. I, 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 want to. <laughs> I want that to be used. Uh, but, uh, okay, uh, I'm maybe different. But uh, yeah, to. to uh, so um, this, this is a whole new perspective. So. I, I think that the. Uh, like, this uh, analytical thing, uh, actually, what what it uh, brought out was that uh, we Cambridge uh, Analytica. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the uh, actually the interesting part there was that they claim, and that's proven actually that it's true, but to some extent it's just believed that by clicking at th some things you actually reveal your uh, uh, psychological identity, so yeah. what kind of a person you are, uh, what are you kind of. Uh, like in, in, in scales of, of being uh, neurotic or uh, depressive or whatever. And that's interesting in the sense, uh, for me, that actually I would like to buy that information. Not that they would use that only to give me those uh, uh, voting uh, propositions, but I would, I would actually like to buy this kind of information about me. So if somebody actually figures out that I'm going to die tomorrow, I would like to run to them. <laughs> um, that would be fun. Mario, what are you, your ideas? Yeah, actually, I, for instance, I don't have an, a Facebook account because uh, well, I come from a police background. And, uh, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no, I don't have one. <laughs> and uh, I know how we work with it. So um, if I, if I uh, go after somebody, uh, of course, I will check out all available data. And 85% are for free on the internet. I don't have to go through government databases a lot to learn about other people. I just go on Facebook, I go on uh, Google, 
and I get all the information or most of the information that I need. Yeah, and this is not something you have to, you know, like organize or something you have to. Just one click. Uh, yes, exactly. So, so this is something actually that is already there, right. but they give up, give out uh, voluntarily. So this is really something that is. Yeah, yeah, you want to say. No, I just wanted to suggest call out to Google for self test, but this That's is the same. You're right, but it's close enough, I think. But about abuse, I, I do think that any single or any like average single person actually doesn't feel violated about his data being being loose or by owned by somebody. I I like the fact that the Estonian government knows enough about me. I okay, I'm okay with any kind of newspaper or whatnot, or maybe not Facebook knowing. But the problem is that by actually aggregating all this big, um, massive uh, movements in the society can, can actually be city. Like the Brexit shows, proof or not, it is very clear that there was some work behind. And if it, if it really didn't work this time, maybe like 1% of the Britain population was affected, then the algorithms which are gathering the data and the charting of the information that I am there for getting, they are getting better, better, better. Uh, coming from the like crypto account, it is saying that algorithms they are the same, but the attacks get better and better. You cannot have a worse attack next, like you are not. The same with the algorithms that use, use the data. The data gets more precise. The processing of this gets more precise, and the psychological effects that using this data gives to the companies or whatever owners of this data, this gets better. So, if now government knows all about me. Maybe it cannot do anything with it, with it, but in 10 years, what not can be done. So the problem is that we don't feel the violations on a private level, but actually like the intelligence and minds who are having, owning this data and using it, they get better and we don't even know yet where they can reach. Mm. So it's an important question that we have talked here that, that the data can be used against citizens. But it can be also used for citizens. For example, I have tried to use uh, several tools created on analyzing big data for, for example, for uh, predict next information attacks. Uh, for example, uh, on Twitter, Syria hoax, this hashtag uh, showed up uh, hours and hours before articles appeared. Uh, and and so on and so forth. So this is only like one example. So this, yes, this is how can we use big data for a common good? I know the answer. Easy. <laughs> and his name is Christian Wassil. <laughs> and uh, last week there was a public lecture about the people in Tartu John Skutta Institute about using the data that has been gathered by Estonian government during the last 10 years on the X road for enhancing the lives of Estonian people. So this work is being done. Uh, analysts, data analysts, politicians, uh, statisticians, statisticians are gathering mm. the data and they are looking at ways how to use the data that the government is gathering. Uh, they are uh, concentrating on the medical services and like how to identify those services which can be pushed more to some people so that they can get medicine better or whatnot. So this work is being done. Mm -hmm. In your work, you also use uh, data or uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, like in, in your previous life, you yeah. you used to use uh, data for you know common good, for uh, discovering criminals. Yes, of so course. This is well, uh, you want to take the criminals off the street, so we need to have data in order to uh, get to him or to her. So, but. Um, as a even more mundane uh, thing, it's look at traffic. Mm. Uh, traffic cameras everywhere. Uh, we find uh, or government or whoever is uh, responsible for transportation. Uh, we see um, where there is a problem and we can solve the problem because of all the data that we accumulate. Let's say uh, there's a hotspot for accidents. So we can, with the data that we accumulate, we can uh, do an analysis and then uh, try to bring down the rate of access accidents in that particular part of town, on that particular street. 
So that is one way of uh, using data, accumulated data by the state uh, for common good. Hmm. Yeah, so I think we also the um, coming coming back to the relation uh, of the common of common good and uh, kind of being the, the kind of positive side of the relation that really you can ask for for your own data and then therefore to aggregate your own uh, digital life set somehow so there you are very good at that uh, that seems to be seen basically you can now before that it was much harder to kind of take your data out of every system where you've been uh, the unfortunate thing is that the kind of analytic uh, done based on uh, your data is not yours that's still theirs but the the actions that led to the uh, results they are getting that's uh, that's still yours so therefore you are much in, in a much better situation to ask for personal treatment based on your data mm. uh, and you can easily imagine that you can get your data out of like different banking systems different medical systems and say well based on that what i have done so far please give me a new offer on, on something that i would like to do um, so so in this mm -hmm. sense the data sets that we have now at our disposal might be much bigger than we have ever imagined um, but on the practical side the big data is helping i think already in so many different places people uh, i like the example of the i think it was New York, uh, where they found, based on the open data, the uh, most expensive parking place in the sense of where you could uh, get to find uh, uh, with the biggest probability. And then they found out that actually there was a hydrant uh, next to the um, next to the parking place uh, on the street, and, and you got fined because of the hydrant. And then they painted it over and it was solved. So it's a very nice story. And, and it was figured out based on the parking fines as well city that where is the place is it the location where is the kind of biggest risk to park uh, and get fined and that and that's how it was solved so it was painted over and nobody parks there anymore so i think that the big data is is, um, is, is helping us everywhere so that we don't see in a similar way like uh, you said about this uh, discrimination that we don't understand that mm. we are discriminated but the, the fact is that a lot of companies today when you are getting your has anybody Flown somewhere with a plane, you ask like uh, for no. an offer on a plane ticket. Then this is actually checking so many different data sets uh, to to find out what is the exactly the best uh, suitable flight for you at the moment. Uh, something that a person would never do. Mm. That's something that machine can do. Mm. Yeah, but I still insist that uh, validating public policy decisions on big data is the biggest benefit to the society that uh, the feedback mechanism that actually feeds into politics to make decisions easier or to maybe supplement one which is made public uh, data helps measurement helps and this is what a top to university is doing good work look it up what they're doing mm. yes yeah, so I, I actually do know a bit about this because mm. this was it was exactly the person i i um, was consulting when i needed this information so <laughs> Um, uh, but you know, in order to have this data, we we need people to trust government enough to you know, give out some some amount of this data. So how can we? How is Estonia managed to go that far that actually people do trust the government? Because one friend of mine was helping uh, uh, United Kingdom to create their e-republic system, and they failed. Uh, simply because uh, United Kingdom, Great Britain does, in Great, Great Britain people do not trust the government. They are happy to give out the data to uh, companies, but not to the government. So basically, uh, they, they ended up with a system when they use people's data, what people gave, gave uh, to different companies to verify their access to the system. So. Yeah, so how, 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 how to restore or how to create that kind of trust? How we manage to do it? We probably never lost it. That's yeah. the whole point. And I think that's... that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is not that hard. Okay. But it's not about that. You could do the same. I mean, actually, UK has done it uh, in different times. In, different policies 
they have done similar things because they have done the system uh, without asking mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the, yeah they have managed some steps and then they were vo voted off so yeah. the, those people who did that they are not in power anymore so in this sense it's a culturally different thing you can still do th stuff yeah, we're, and we're, it, it doesn't work in UK it yeah. works in Estonia for whatever reason now when you talk about trust it's it's there are some rational factors and some irrational factors if you have a data breach scandal of course it's not good for your trust um, but um, on the other hand it depends very much on your cultural tradition I was very when when um, 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 Markus Fächer, I don't know if he's here. If, ah, here. Uh, when he explained to me what is possible in Estonia with your health data, that you have your health data record uh, stored somewhere and you have access to that, uh, I, w I thought, wow, great, uh, I would like to have that. Uh, but in Germany, it's impossible. We have had for 15 years discussions about that now, but political parties and different interest groups couldn't compromise on it because of data uh, protection fear um, issues. Um, I, I, in my whole lifetime, I maybe was at 50 doctors or so. If you move from city to city, you do not have a, a home doctor anymore. So my whole um, health data is uh, at these 50 doctors. Mm. And if I have a heart attack now, um, uh, the doctor here would never know uh, if, what diseases I have, what blood group I have, so they have to do the research from the very beginning if I'm going to the hospital, which is, I think, bad. <laughs> so really? I would, I would love to have all these data stored at uh, at one uh, location, but there is in Germany not enough trust, as you said, mm -hmm. to to erect such a system. Yeah. I actually do think. Uh, in the question of what makes us trust our government, we have a big oppressive neighbor, and this helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> because, and I, I'm serious on this, uh, if you have a common enemy, or at least a common something that to persuade us enemy, it makes it easy to have better trust within your own family. If we were still a part of the Russian Federation or Soviet Union or whatnot, we would be the same, probably the people who would be working in the office in Estonia would be the same, but the trust would not be there. So I actually think that the fact that we have a small nation state with its own language, culture, whatnot, which is standing against those all big European Union, big Russia, I think it actually creates trust. Mm -hmm. You should try the same. <laughs> <laughs> to have a big enemy. <laughs> it's too far away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, but it, Any other it's, ideas it, it, trust is, is such a big word which is always used in these discussions uh, as well. For example, it is, um, it is um, uh, an advertisement uh, expression um, by those people who promote the general data protection regulation. They hope that with these uh, very strict rules, trust will be, there will be more trust, trust in companies and trust in government so that people um, use um, uh, data services more as they do now. I'm always a little bit skeptical if, if, if this trust issue mm. isn't uh, overestimated, mm. because yeah. people do it anyway, <laughs> with companies. Uh, as you said, with governments, it's, 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 it's different. But I think that also the, the idea that we take uh, as a basis of a regulation, uh, something that you don't trust them. There, there are reasons for trust, and you, and you try to build with the regulation uh, trust, and you hope that based on the regulation, which assumes that everybody is a crook, uh, creates a trust in the society. That's kind of controversial. Uh, itself. Mm. If the law is enforced, and in the end the outcome is good, then I would say in a very slow, long process, trust maybe uh, grow. But um, therefore, the law must ha ha must ha must be good, and it must be enforced, uh, so mm. that everyone um, has the feeling: oh yes, there is this law that protects me, protects me. Don't, don't you think that uh, what's what's really apparent in the uh, violence to enforcement political dynamics in the past few years, apparently? So, in my opinion, actually, most of the violence across the world. 
Well, democracy is uh, even a bigger word than <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. power. But uh, this is all about, like, there's a law. You are innocent until proven guilty. In and some countries, yes. <laughs> In some countries, vice versa. <laughs> You are guilty until you can prove that you're innocent. So, so it is uh, like it depends on the culture where you are. <laughs> it is not something that is globally recognized as, as a truth. I, I'm, I believe, in, at least in Western uh, European countries, uh, the danger uh, lies more with the big companies mm -hmm. than with the government. Actually, I think. I, I think. Uh, most of the Western uh, European governments are much more trustworthy than big companies like uh, we saw in the movie. And if, well, coming back to those big companies, they are from the US, let's take the Western uh, uh, country called the uh, US, for example. And, and this Western uh, uh, country, US, asked or actually forced the companies within that uh, country to reveal the data. Uh, not that uh, Facebook and Google wanted to uh, contribute to the uh, public good. It was actually forced. Uh, so uh, wh why do you think that UK or, or Germany is so much different? Especially Germany, you, you know it best. Yeah, uh, from my experience, I've, I've, I have, uh, of course, on a very low level, but I have experience with German government, with German uh, civil service. and. Um, I don't see, from my point of view, that there is any big reason to uh, mistrust the German government. That they don't ask data from their companies yeah. that they are not uh, supposed to, to know. To okay. use against me. To use against me as a as a, uh, law <laughs> as a law abiding as a law citizen. Uh, I'm not a citizen at all. So against me. That's mm. the whole point. Uh, whether you care about me. So I, I thank you. I think we can open it up now for questions. So if anybody. Has you have something to ask. Or comment. Because um, <coughs> the has trust, but um, uh, on the other hand, 
you don't even have a digital market that's fully owned by you. You're not even creating the devices. So where does the threat come from? Um, at least one big thing to look at the European Union lawmaking is that they are not trying to protect the citizen. They are not even trying to protect their rights, civil rights, but, not, but they are actually protectionists trying to protect the market. And by believing that uh, by strengthening the laws on the European service providers and whatnot, we are creating more trust in the uh, European service providers and instead of uh, buying a phone made by Samsung using a ramp rating system by Google, you are going to trust European device creators more and they were going to buy an European phone with European operating system. At least this is the thinking that I feel coming from Brussels, that, they are that the regulations are there for protection of the market and for the European to choose our own products more, yeah, even though they don't exist. Far behind, like there are things like Bitcoin going on, we cannot even jump on it. I know, but this is the, <laughs> still, I think this is like the thinking I feel coming from Brussels. Any more questions? Or comments. Uh, <laughs> you, you want to make the comment then? Sorry, about charging, workers' charge. Actually, yeah, we are far behind here, fortunately, in Europe. In the United States, some judges using algorithms to decide how hard the punishment has to be. Mm -hmm. So I, I really hope that the managing institution of uh, in Europe or anywhere else in the world, because I lost my job as a journalist. But, uh, well, um, yeah, one is the protection of market, but the other thing is protection and use of it. This is just examples on using of uh, free data. I'm agree with that. But you don't need personal information to realize that for people from sleeping areas traveling to the center, the city center, or, or, or city center, every morning and going back in the evening. You don't need for that for personal data. No, of course not for many for many purposes anonymized or pseudonymized <coughs> data are sufficient. But of course if you want to have individualized uh, products or maybe an individualized medical treatment then it's difficult to do with anonymous data. It's, 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 it depends always on the context. I, I think that the right thing here to mention is that <coughs> the threat there is, and, and that's also kind of covered by the regulation, but uh, is the tools that we have. Like those tools that say that well, my phone should not be followed or something like that. Uh, those do to some extent uh, lose my identity from the data. The threat there is that uh, by me making those decisions, I can lose my data from like all three or four or five data sets uh, that have my kind of data somewhere, but they don't know who I am. But when somebody then combined those total anonymous data sets, they would find out that it's me. Yeah. And, and, and therefore the personal data kind of appears, it wasn't there, but it appears later on. And, and, and that's kind of still yeah, so something is possible. I won't have a hackathon where it was provided anonymous information system or data package for a person. <coughs> and one group took and using all public information on the internet and personalized the mm. package immediately. But I wanted to oh, I wanted to say one thing to your example um, uh, about judges. Um, 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 deciding uh, automatically by no, algorithms. No. Was, so they are using. It it it's, 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 it's they're using. Like a hint to the yeah. judge to predict yeah. the possible behavior in future. Yeah. 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 There yeah. is. There is again. It's not black and white. Uh, I have read a, a study that said uh, judges um, after lunch are uh, doing much um, less uh, harder uh, sanctions uh, than before lunch. <laughs> so. Uh, they discriminated because they are human beings and uh, the algorithm is done by human beings uh, as well I know but um, might be in some respects more neutral so that this discrimi discrimination would not happen anymore this, this for me it's completely clear a human being should do the judgment <laughs> uh, this is actually a, a, an algorithm that is covered by a book called uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Uh, that is, so it was uh, a bad example? 
it, it, my point? it is it is very bad example from the point of discrimination. It's very discriminatory. I, I have to check next time. Uh, but yeah, so. <laughs> yes, I want to have a word about transportation. Whoever <laughs> thinks that transportation doesn't want your private data is so wrong. So who was the like uh, forefront of connectees, self-driving cars, Google? Why? Because they want to decide instead of you where to go. You tell the car, I want to have a pizza, and the car decides where is the nearest pizza joint and gets you that. My you, nearest. You, you, okay, whatever, <laughs> what, whatever Google thinks fits for you. Exactly. You, want to, you tell the car, I want to get to a nightclub. Google thinks a bit, looks at your point, surfing habits that you have ever had, and then gets you to the right nightclub. That like connected cars, be they self-driving or not, they want to know who is inside them. They want to report to the, the mother company. Where did you go? What did you do? What did you consume? Did you set? Uh, did you like rate it five stars or one and so on? So the transportation data is going to be the next big forefront. There is going to be a fight between the governments and private companies on this. But never say that transportation doesn't want to private data. They do want it. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is very personal. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the uh, the thing with the personalized data and non-personalized data is, is that you can do some stuff without personal data, and uh, it is a bit more costly normally because it's much easier to say who you are, and therefore through the fact that you are who you claim you are. We can connect the data points. Uh, we can kind of create another kind of mechanism for that, but it would be at least a little bit more costly. And uh, and it would make sense if we would be assured to the end that you will remain anonymous. But as I said before, until we are not sure that we can maintain that status, it is not worth the effort. To some extent, at least, uh, it's not worth the effort everywhere to work with that. Like Germany is a good example. You don't have the connectivity between different databases there. Nobody knows that you were the same patient in those 50 different doctors. Even you don't remember that, that you were there. So nobody knows that you were there. Mm -hmm. But then at some point when he would investigate you, he would connect the dots and he would still make the uh, case that it was you. So, so Actually, our e health system is not so good as it is. They don't know. It's very, very civil servant friendly, but it's very unpatient friendly. Yeah, but it, but it uh, supports a, uh, a uh, cost system or, or basically the, the cost uh, allocation very well. But I think that the, the point was that was made before, I think that this is very valid point to the uh, overall the regulation and I think that we didn't stress that enough. Uh, but that's the uh, that's really the core, that, that we we have no clue how to give you the tools to make those conscious decisions all the time and how to take it back very easily because you don't remember where you made those decisions. And uh, and we will be all be bullied by that because uh, somebody would claim that yes, you need to give me the content, consent here or I did get it from somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, and, and, and there is no proof or evidence left behind. And it's very hard to actually do that technically at, at some point. Let me say one thing. Um, your country has a very good reputation for your data yeah. processing uh, uh, facilities, ability, in, in, in at least in where I am working. Every month someone comes to, to us, to our uh, ministry and tells us um, uh, why aren't we doing it like in Estonia everything is so great what they are doing there and you are very good at least your politicians are, and your uh, companies are very good in promoting <laughs> your system um, so um, if they meet our chancellor or, or, or my minister um, a week later there is on my desk table again the question why can't we do it like in Estonia <laughs> There's a like this big difference between the countries is that in Estonia nobody asks the end user or the person sitting in here, do we actually want to use it? Yeah. The the country itself decided uh, that we're gonna go and roll the whole thing out. Still, uh, <laughs> country as such 
doesn't make decisions. Decisions are made by the political bodies. And the political bodies are, at least to some extent, in democratic systems, expressing the will of the citizens. So to say that like it happened, it sprung from nothing, <laughs> that this the like ID code that we're having, the databases that we have, they came into being. <laughs> Somebody made a conscious decision and nobody was at least opposed to it. There were people opposed to opposing, but they were not uh, uh, okay. well, they were in opposition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this data didn't come. Yeah, but for example in Germany there will be public votes regarding it and the Changing of all polling stations and so on, but in Estonia it's like about what? No, there is exactly. no public voting in Germany about yeah. that. That's more Swiss kind of yeah. thing. Uh, in different countries, yeah. Okay. Yeah. In Estonia, because everything is connected to the X networks, so yeah. it's auto minded that everything is going to be digitalized, and there is yeah. a heading uh, yeah. by the country that everything is, is digitalized and. Or the people are thinking as well that everything is digitalized. Yeah. So, actually, I would support you and saying yes. Of course, it's the parliament who decides, and the parliament is democratically elected. But there is some 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 truth in what you were saying mm -hmm. because uh, once such a system is um, installed and people uh, get used to it, it's very very difficult for maybe another government to completely change it. Once, once things have been decided upon in a democracy, normally it should be possible to revise them, to revise the decisions. But um, in a digital, digitalized world, uh, such decisions are very long lasting and, and very difficult to change them uh, in a democratic way. It no becomes problem. a part of culture. It becomes a, another culture, yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, our time is over. So very last question to every of you. Uh, what next? What will happen? You already talked about uh, self-driving cars. <laughs> so there's Internet of Things. We know what is will soon come. So soon our refrigerator knows ourselves like ourselves more than we do. So so what's next? How the big data will change that uh, whole way of thinking, and how can we actually manage to? Form the way we change the world so that we could change it for a better, not for a worse. Hmm. So let's let's start with you. Well, I will have to let myself be surprised about that <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have the background, so I cannot make a. a How do you want this to change then? Because oh, you, want for your work. Well, uh, I have really no idea where it's going to end. <laughs> um, I personally don't like too much information of myself being out there, but on the other hand, I actually uh, I kind of live from the of the the information that is out there for my job. So it's like a, so okay. So it's very interesting. No, so, so basically, you want more information to be out there. I want to I, want, use it. I want better yes, information, yes, of yes. course, but, but I don't want to provide it myself. About you. So. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so, go. so in my opinion. The world as such is going to a maybe not wrong but at least dangerous direction and at the same time i do think that european union mm -hmm. whatever we think about it and like whatever movies we, we see actually is maybe resisting or at least trying to uh, change this train to a more uh, let's say correct direction so that i actually do think that european union is doing as good work as possible in this so Please support politicians or supporting European unions, but just for your own personal safety, if you have any kids, then teach them hacking skills, how to use the data, how to abuse it, how to pay your pension in the late age. <laughs> <laughs> but vote in the correct way. Uh, I also agree with you. I do not have the hacking? technical background oh, okay. to do to uh, do uh, prognosis for the future. I only can answer personally um, what can be done technically and scientifically, uh, mankind has always done. And there is always the discussion uh, about what can the law do against negative consequences. I, for me personal, have decided that I'm not future pessimistic. 
that um, the, I, I think mankind will survive. Um, I do not believe in those horror paintings that are, that are done, that we are losing our, uh, actually our nature, our, our freedom to decide that we are manipulated all the time. I think there are a lot of counter uh, processes. Um, some, some concepts are changing. The concept of privacy is very fast changing. Um, and that are processes that will go further. But I think um, you, there is no sense in complaining about what is just happening, about what is just happening. Mm. Good. Yeah, to continue with that, I think that the, uh, the discussion about kids is very important. So the generations, the, the unfortunate thing is that the generation that is growing at the moment is not worrying about the stuff that we are regulating at the moment. So, so and, and the generation in power who is doing those regulations probably doesn't get it very quickly. So, so that's, uh, that's in, in this sense, it's, it's, a, um, it's an issue that, uh, that some people still have, but in coming years, maybe we don't have that issue so much. Uh, uh, but the decisions that we today think that we as humans must make about the world and global, um, on a global scale, I think that those we won't make in 20 years. I'm not sure. We would be freed from that job very quickly, hopefully, because we are not very good at that. <laughs> Thank you. So, Steiner, for you. Uh, I want to say thank you and Ralph for very helpful to all being here, and uh, especially to our uh, panelists uh, for being here and having such enlightening discussion, and to Goethe Institute uh, for uh, partnering with us and uh, bringing this exhibition here. In cooperation with the Czech Film. So, everybody who hasn't seen the show yet, uh, come to the Tallinn Art Hall and have a look. And uh, your exhibition is advertising spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the very, to the very the, targeted group. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and not discriminating anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but which, which is very pessimistic, the, the exhibition. <laughs> so, uh, there is a wonderful. Uh, for the program for lesbian uh, children in schools and classes in uh, Nairobi. Scholar uh, is participating there, and uh, they will, I don't know if they're going to teach them hacking skills, but at least the skills how to kind of survive the internet or how they switch off uh, being secure. Something like that. So thanks. Yep.